Good morning, everyone. And um, this is the last session of, of the talk. And we're very lucky to have a colleague from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, uh, Stoino Stoinov. And he's going to talk to us about one of the proteins that's involved in regulating or connecting DNA re uh, replication and cell size homostasis. So take it away. Hello, everybody. My name is Toinov Stoinov, and I would like to thank uh, the organizers who invited me to present my work entitled Dear 2 with the crossword between DNA replication and cell size homeostasis. Cell size affects cell physiology in key way because it determines the scale of organelles and the rates of biosynthetical processes. In a cellular organism such as budding keys typically vary little about their mean size to suggest the existence of mechanisms uh, for cell size control. Cell size control requires coordination between cell growth and the cell cycle. However, the mechanisms that harmonize the cell's growth with cell divisions are not fully understood. Herein, we study the role of DIA2, the F-box protein of CSF E3 between ligase in the control of the cell size of budding yeast. DIA2 is involved in termination of DNA replications. Here is the typical replication fork with MCM replicative helicase, which is connected with uh, CD245 and this to the replicative polymerase. And CTF4 and MRC1 participate in coordination between replicative uh, synthesis and unwinding. Actually, DIA2 CSF uh, ubiquitin ligase, ET ubiquitin ligase is recruited via binding uh, CTF4 and MRC1 proteins. Once bound to the home, uh, to, uh, to the replication fork, it will be ubiquitin late during termination, it will be continuate uh, MCM7 subunits of MCM complex, and this allows CDC48 to remove MCM7 and to destabilize MCM complex. And destabilization of MCM complex actually allows the polymerase to finish, uh, to, terminate, uh, to terminate the replication. Uh, However, it is still unclear if the G2 uh, CSF G2 it will be between the days destabilize CTF form or the other proteins of replication form. That was this is our first goal to follow. To do this, we generate uh, budding kids train with uh, when uh, where G2 is deleted and CTF form protein is uh, tagged with uh, GFP. GFPH. And uh, next, we uh, test if GFP tag does not change the viability of the CTF GFP strain. As, as you can see, the viability of CTF for GFP is, uh, is viable as the wild type strain. And this is the same with uh, GF2 deletion strain. Next, we check the cell cycle of the tier 2 deficient strain. And as you can see, the cell cycle duration of the tier 2 deficient strain is 50 minutes uh, longer than the wild type strain. And this is in part due to the longer G2M phase, because normally G2M phase is only 20 25 minutes. In CTF, uh, in tier 2 deletion strain, it is about 40 minutes. Then, uh, next, we would like to see uh, if the DIA2 is responsible for uh, controlling the amount of CTF4 throughout the cell cycle. As in wild type strains, the, uh, CTF4 protein is increased, uh, in increase your amount during G1 phase, stay high during S phase, and diminish on the border between S phase and G2M phase. In contrast, um, uh, in tier 2 deletion strain, CTF4 proteins stay longer. And you can see it in the half of the G2M phase. To confirm these results by bulk assay, we, 
we synchronize uh, the uh, uh, we synchronize the cells with hydroxyl here in the S phase for two hours, and after that we release the cells in the cell cycle and check them with antibody against GFP. As you can see, in the 30 and 40 minutes after release, uh, after he washing with hydroxyl here, the amount of the CTF4 protein is increased uh, in, in, com in comparison with the wild type strain. And this is uh, this is the time this time um, point response from the time when the um, actually the cells uh, the cells uh, go from S phase to G two M phase. Next, we'll, uh, next we'd like to check uh, to check if the chroma, uh, CTF chromatin, uh, which is bind to the chromatin, is removed, uh, is not removed due, uh, when D2 is deleted. To do this, we um, fractionalize uh, the, the crude chromatin into crude extract in supernatant and pellet, and, in the, and the chromatin fraction is in the pellet actually. As you can see, after two hours in hydroxyl air, in wild type and in the dear 2 deletion strains, uh, part of the CTF4 is bound to the chromatin. But after 30 and 40 minutes, in the wild type strain, it's significantly diminished. In contrast, it's still almost the same in dear 2 deletion strains. Our results suggest that actually deletion of dear 2 lead to increase uh, to to keep the quantity of the CTF4 protein on the chromatin in the beginning of G2M phase after, uh, after completion of DNA replications. And uh, this actually suggests that even in G2M phase, uh, not only MCM is not uh, properly removed from the chromatin, but also in the protein like CTF4 and maybe MRC1. But uh, when we study the two deletion cells, what we saw actually that part of the cell and 27% of the cells are elongated, and uh, the ratio between uh, X and Y axis is 1.4, which is significantly longer than 1.1 in the wild type cells. Also, what we saw actually that uh, the uh, uh, two deleting, uh, deleted cells are about two times bigger, the, the area is two times bigger than in wild type cells. To see what uh, really going on, you can see this movie and you can see the, the strains become really long, but except this, we also have multinucleation in the sum of the cells and once and we have multinucleation and also once uh, some of the nuclear once divide after, uh, once divided after that you can see here once they are divided and after that they merge again this actually happened when even more more logically divided uh, uh, the separate nuclei still have DNA bridges which connect them and this allow them to combine after a while. Anyway, 8% of the cells in the DNA 2 deletion strands are multinucleated. It was found actually that DNA 2 participate in the pseudo hephal filamentous grow. Um, however, in typical pseudo hephal filamentous grow, um, the cells are still mononucleated, which is completely different than what we see in the DA2 deletion cells. Uh, usually, the uh, budding keys have a mechanism to prevent multinucleations. They have mechanism which uh, uh, move the nucleus to the bud neck in pure end phase. And this allows actually of the cells uh, when nucleus divide, both of them are going with different uh, 
in the daughter and mother cells. And this, it seems that in the dear two deletion strains, this process is somehow abrogated. <laughs> to summarize, you know, delay, delay, delays removal of CTF4 and MCM killing case from the chromatin during termination of DNA deletion of DNA2, delays removal of CTF and MCM killing case from the chromatin during termination of DNA replication, increases the cell size of the cell, uh, leads to cell elongations and to lead to cell multinucleations. It, to see, uh, that's why there, um, to see if actually problem with uh, completion of DNA replications results in the uh, leads to elongation of the cells and multinucleations, we actually uh, decided to inhibit DNA synthesis by hydroxyurea. Inhibition by hydroxyurea, uh, by hydroxyurea actually increases the cell cycle from 120 to 400 seconds. And however, the, the cells still complete to divide. Uh, as you can see, first, in only without hydroxyurea, the cell cycle is about 120 minutes in the wild type cells. However, when you put hydroxyurea, the cell cycle continue about 400 seconds, but the cells complete to divide, and because even the cell cycle is slowed down, the goal is also slowed down, and the cells are with the same size. What's happened with the two deletion cells, actually? Okay, without hydroxyurea, they, uh, they divide, but a little bit longer, and uh, one of the cells is elongated, but when you put hydroxyurea, you can see the cells, the, the location become really high. The cell, uh, the, there are some problem with the, uh, of the nuclear to divide, and there are some con how connected with the DNA bridges. And when we put the hydroxyurea, actually the percent of the elongated cells increased from 27 to 57%. And also the size of the cells, uh, yeah, the ratio between X, uh, the, between X and Y axis also increased. And the area increased, and which mean that DNA2 is required for coordination between cell goal and cell cycle in order to control cell size variation and to prevent multinucleation. But improper completion of implication of DNA2 deletion straight and the extended G2M phase is necessary to trigger abnormal cell size and morphology. And these are the people which participate in this study. It's Marina Nidelcheva, Nelly Ivanova, Alexander Timin, and Sonia Ozunwa. And this is my group. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we certainly have time for uh, questions. And you guys all remember how to use the raise hand and the participant button. So I'll wait a second uh, to see if a question comes up. Um, yeah, I have, uh, perhaps while we're waiting, uh, a, a quick question, uh, Stoyo, uh, Stono. Uh, when, you know, it is really suggestive that it all, the variations all come about because you're messing up the replication, the DNA replication cycle. And um, so first I was thinking, oh, if you just make too many nuclei, that would explain it, you're just getting too many lipids being formed, um, uh, manufactured, but it, it seems that could be part of the reason, but if I understand the last set of experiments, you've actually delayed when the replication starts. Is that uh, what the effect of that? Let's see, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh. The problem is normally the cells have checkpoint control, and if uh -huh. something is wrong, let's say like uh, the replication is not finished, you cannot go 
to let's say nuclear division uh -huh. but somehow in the two this is this is somehow compromise and there are two three, two three different checkpoints actually and all of them it seems to be compromised to see such effects and we don't know actually how this happened because you can see but uh, you still, because only part of the population, let's say 25% uh, is uh, have such a phenotype, that's why we think that you need something to trigger this process. Normally, if you have, let's say, problem, problem, uh, you have DNA damage and something, something like this, the checkpoint mm -hmm. is, it's easy actually to be activated because you have single strand DNA and so on. But uh, in this case, Probably you don't have DNA damage, but you have proteins which are supposed to not to be there. And this is really difficult for checkpoint actually to check because you don't have double, you don't have single strand DNA. That's why I, I think uh, the checkpoints are somehow, uh, they cannot understand that they, the cells have problems. They are not, mm -hmm. uh, they are not activated. That's why we have such a, such a phenotype. This is this our suggestion section. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, um, and then maybe just one other uh, quick question. When you have them, the cell morphology change, uh, uh, trying to think back with your uh, diagrams about the surface area. So is it that you're maintaining more or less the same surface, uh, maybe the same number of uh, 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 lipids, in the membrane, but it's just being distorted, or does the in the ones that go wild, it's a, a, a definite increase also in the surface area. Mm, because normally, when when the uh, unicellular organism grow in uh, rich media, they are circle because surface mm -hmm. to volume ratio is the smallest one. Right. But uh, this is the mechanism actually pseudo high file grow is the way because this happens when you have starvation for something and mm -hmm. when the cells elongate the surface to ratio to volume ratio is increased and you have possibility to have more nu nutrients let's say and i don't know how this yeah there are some suggestions how this is regulated but uh, the connection with the cell cycle actually in pseudo hifal grow is missing actually how this happens no one's no there are several mechanisms for pseudo hippal growth, but they actually only say how the how the cells form the chains, but not why how they elongate non hip tell you know. And this and okay. this is really important actually because all chemical reactions, the rate of the chemical reactions are changed, the ratio between the organelle is changing if you change the, the area actually of the cells. It's really important to keep it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, I think if there are no further questions, we can thank you one more time and then we'll um, thank you again. And then we'll proceed on to the next speaker. If Kelly could uh, cue that talk up, uh, it's going to be uh, Jonah uh, Eaton at New York University. And uh, he will be talking about the structural and dynamics signatures of local DNA damage in live cells. Hello everyone, I am Jonah Eaton and I study chromatin dynamics after DNA damage in Professor Sadowska's lab at New York University. Um, so in this lab, we study chromatin, uh, which is a complex of DNA and associated proteins, such as histones, found inside the cell nucleus. During interface, this chromatin is in uncondensed polymeric form. Um, and although chromatin has many different length scales of organization and structure, chromatin is highly dynamic um, and connected to different biological processes. In general, those dynamics have been described as subdiffusive with micron scale ATP dependent correlated motion over multiple seconds. In my experiment, I study how the dynamics of chromatin changes in response to DNA damage. DNA damage is any chemical or physical change to the structure of DNA. This damage is pretty bad for a cell. If the damage is left unrepaired, cells will die or become cancerous. The type of damage that I focus on is called the double strand break. 
that is a physical cut of the polymer, and it's particularly bad because it could be pretty hard to get the two different strands to reconnect. Luckily, our cells have developed DNA repair mechanisms, which we know from previous experiments can drastically alter chromatin dynamics. For example, when damaged, the correlated motion in chromatin completely disappears. So how is this related to physics? We're all interested in active far from equilibrium physics, and chromatin is the perfect model system to study this never at equilibrium phenomena. Meanwhile, DNA damage is a point perturbation that should let us carefully study the local and global changes to active dynamics. So in my experiment, I used transgenic HeLa cells, and we caused damage with a chemical called neocarcinosation, or NCS for short. And then we used three different concentrations of NCS, and images are results using a simultaneous two-color confocal microscopy setup, taking 25-second streams at a 250 millisecond exposure. In these streams, we visualize H2B GFP, which is a good uh, proxy for the chromatin position and compaction. Um, and then we also look at 53BP1M cherry, which localizes very quickly to the site of a DSB, forming a focus around the particular break site, as you can see in these particular images. And then we do this for a very large number of cells. So once we have all of our data, the next step is we locate our DSB foci using a custom machine learning algorithm. And then we count the number of DSBs in every single cell. Um, as, although I'm not showing the data right here, as, you know, as we go to greater concentrations of the drug, we do find that we have more breaks as one would expect. For those breaks, uh, break foci that have a high signal to noise ratio, we track the movement of the double strand break foci centroids with 13 nanometer precision. Um, and the ensemble at mean square displacements from that are shown right here. Um, as you can see, we obtain subdiffusive motion for our double strand break foci. Um, and, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the different concentration of our drug. Um, so this is pretty great, um, but by itself, these dynamics do not seem to be that interesting. Um, and so the next step is we want to uh, sort our breaks into two different categories based on their location inside of the cell nucleus. Um, in one category, we have the periphery. Those are the double strand breaks that are less than one micron from the nuclear edge, the nuclear periphery. Um, and in the other category, we have the breaks in the nuclear interior, and those are double strand foci that are more than one micron from the nuclear edge. After dividing, we see this really dramatic difference in mobility between these two different groups. Um, but we can actually do a lot better than just this, this average mean square displacement right here. We can look at each GSB in the population and compare the distributions of those mobilities. And so what we do is we look at the trajectory of a particular double strand break foci, and we fit a convex polygon over that trajectory. And the area of that polygon, which we call AL, or the area over um, traveled over long time, 25 seconds, um, gives us a measure for how mobile our double strand break foci are. And what we find is if we um, look at those distributions seen right here, where the darker colors are the interior, these lighter colors are in the periphery, we see that double strand break foci in the interior are about two times more mobile than those found on the periphery. So our next step is to take a closer look at the local network at every single break site. And so to do that, we first look at the amount of chromatin compaction at a break site normalized to the global signal, which we call ICH. Um, and that's the, ICH is sort of the compaction of the double strand break, uh, the double strand, center of the double strand break foci, sorry. Um, and so we, you know, we can obviously plot this for all of our different cells, and that's shown in purple. This is the, the sort of the compaction, the chromatin compaction at all of the break, at all of the breaks over all of our different cells. Um, and compared to the chromatin intensity at random sites in the control cells, um, we see that the chromatin compaction at our double strand breaks are clearly more compacted. They have higher ICH values than those at random sites um, as, um, and random sites as one would expect are center ground one because this is how we've defined um, the way we've normalized this particular signal. Um, the other measure that we have for chromatin looks at how the chromatin compaction changes as one moves radially away from the break site, which we call SREL, and that's sort of the slope of the compaction. Um, and again, we see a similar story. Chromatin becomes less compacted as one moves away from a particular break site. Um, 
and this is uh, so this is sort of similar to the situation we have where we have higher chromatin compactions at the break site. And we hypothesize that this is because chromatin locally compacts as part of the repair process. Um, to test this, we select a subpopulation of the random points in our control cells, such they have a similar distribution of ICH values as our real breaks. We call these simulated breaks um, and color them pink. And then what we do is we look at how peaked the chromatin network is at the site of those stimulated breaks and compare that to our real breaks. And as we can see, the SREL values of real breaks, seen in this purple line right here, are clearly shifted to more negative values than one would expect if the DSBs were to simply occur in more dense chromatin, which is sort of what would be the case for our stimulated breaks. So we can conclude that DSBs, uh, the, the double strand breaks, cause roughly 20 to 30% increase in the local chromatin condensation, um, just by virtue of there being damage right there. So we think this is part of what's going with part of the repair process. Um, and we can do this similar, so all this calculation was done for the interior, but we have a very similar story for the, for the nuclear periphery. Um, so next we ask, how, do the how does the double strand break repair process affect the mobility? So what we do is we track the double strand break foci in damaged cells that have been depleted with ATP, thus hindering some of the repair mechanisms that could influence the dynamics. Shown in yellow, we find that this leads to a strong reduction in the double strand break mobility. But we also need a proper negative control for the dynamics um, and by tracking the movement of healthy chromatin. This is challenging since we're tracking repair foci, which by definition are not going to be there for us to track if there's no damage to repair. So to solve this, we developed a novel way to track undamaged patches of chromatin that are similar to the compaction at damaged sites. As we just showed, the act of causing a DSB and its subsequent repair creates a unique compaction profile at the site of a, uh, at the break site. So we use this unique com compaction signature to find double strand break similar patches of chromatin, which we term mock DSBs shown in this orange. Finally, we track the centroids of these mock DSBs using the same tracking algorithms just in the chromatin uh, H2B GFP signal. And so here's an example of what one of those trajectories looks like. Um, and what we find if once you compare to real double strand breaks, we find this, these patches of undamaged chromatin are less mobile as measured by this long-term area explored measure that we have right here. So again, purple are real DSBs, and we see that for both the ATP depleted one and the mock DSBs, there's, they're less mobile. And then, so to verify that these decreases are actually from activity and not due to some changes in the chromatin compaction, we actually plot this mobility as a function of ICH. Um, for our real DSBs, we actually see that there's a clear systematic decrease in the mobility uh, with increases in chromatin compaction. And interestingly, for the, both the ATP depleted DSBs and the undamaged sites, both follow the systematic decrease in the mobility. But for any given compaction, our controls have lower mobility than those of our active repair sites. Interestingly, these two controls practically lie on, on the same line when viewed, or practically collapse onto the same line when viewed in this way. All of this suggests that the unique dynamics of double strand breaks is actively driven by a repair-related ATP consuming process. This is a really huge result. It's known that ATP participates in DNA repair but it's not obvious that the mechanism would manifest it in some translational, effective translational motion. So to complete our picture of all the factors that affect DNA repair foci dynamics, we introduce one more variable, um, the size of the repair protein aggregate, which we term uh, R sub B or RB, the, which is the effective size of our double strand break focus. And then by comparing the mobility uh, and size of each break, we find another relationship um, where the mobility decreases as you get larger and larger break foci, but this is really only the case in the nuclear interior. As mentioned in the previous slide, we also see that the mobility decreases with an increase in the local chromatin compaction, but again, we find this only occurs in the nuclear interior. So we see both the size of the break and the local compaction as two ways to affect, to basically increase the effective hydrodynamic radius of the break. So using all of these different results, we can uh, put together this, uh, this, this chart of basically describing the universal behavior of what affects dynamics of double-strand break foci. 
And so what we first find is what dominates mobility is location inside the cell nucleus. When you have a break in the nuclear interior, um, it's, uh, when, it, when you have a break, I'm sorry, when you have a break near the nuclear periphery, you seem to have these wall effects appear to dominate um, and you get this lower mobility. Once you're in the nuclear interior, then the dynamics are best described by this map that we, sh we show right here. And what matters most at this stage is the network, or from the physical point of view, the effective size of the double strand break focus. So once you're in the nuclear interior, it's really the size of your focus, the little compaction, the things that affect the local, the effective hydrodynamic radius of the break. And then once you control for those things, you find that, um, you find that it's really the activity um, that's going on at the break then is what changes the dynamics. And so if you have this active repair, you find that the mobility of your break is going to increase. So lastly, I just want to quickly summarize everything I just talked to you guys about. Um, this study uh, is the largest study of mammalian double strand break foci. We've uh, uh, looked at over 16,000 double strand breaks in over 600 cells. And by doing this large population analysis, we find that double spread foci in the nuclear interior are about two times more mobile than those in the nuclear periphery. We would also find that double spread breaks cause this enhanced local chromatin condensation. And we also find that double spread break motion is subdiffusive, ATP dependent, and unique from what you would find in similarly compacted undamaged chromatin. Um, and then we also, by basically taking all these different measurements, we're able to just universally describe the mobility of double spray break foci by basically if you if I know the number of the size of your break focus the compaction at it the sort of the number of break foci you have if there's energy in your system I can get a pretty good estimate of what your double spray break mobility is going to be and these are basically all static variables that we can measure in order to get this dynamic measurement an estimate of this dynamic measurement and finally our results really allow us to identify or allow us to identify DNA damage in live cells and sort of help us better understand DNA repair, which is really crucial for how healthy cells um, function and, is un and as well as sort of how we can understand diseases such as cancer. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for, uh, for your time. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the NYU and uh, the organizers for organizing all this and of course our funding sources for the obvious reasons. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the uh, floor is open for questions. So I'll bring up the participants list. It's a little slow. Someone would like to ask a question. Um, Megan King, take it away. Hey, that was very cool. Was very cool. I you. wanted to ask, um, so with respect to the periphery, do you think that the difference in dynamics is related to the breaks somehow being dealt with differently at the periphery? Or do you think there's something about that environment of the chromatin at the periphery that is kind of itself imposing the difference in the dynamics you see? Uh, so we currently actually have, we're working on a paper to sort of better understand what's going on at the periphery. Um, and uh, yeah, so because that paper is in, in uh, sorry, because that paper is actually like in production and we're gonna be submitting it soon, I feel a little weird about talking about it. Um, but it does, there does seem to be some sort of wall effect that's, uh, we think it has more to do with a geometrical, physical aspect rather than a biological uh, source. But that's, I probably am gonna get in trouble for saying that, but. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, but yeah, that's, that's, there'll, be, there'll be a new paper coming out soon uh, with their sort of a close, better focus on that. And uh, my second question was, do you have any idea of, I'm just wondering which what mechanisms you're thinking about are driving the local compaction? So at least the things that I can think of is, right, there's loading of cohesins at, at, at double strand, around double strand breaks, and there's also evidence Right, that there's kind of an initial transcriptionally active state and then a transcriptionally repressive state. I was just wondering if you had any ideas of how you're thinking about the processes that might be involved. In yes, when I think about the compaction, sort of the compaction that's going on, I think there's this paper that Mistelli and I think it was Krulak did in, I think it was 2014, 
where they show that there was, you know, this first ATP dependent uh, uh, sort of expansion of the chromatin um, followed by this recondensation. I do not remember exactly which were the proteins that were associated with that further compaction, um, but I can email you the paper because we believe that what we're observing is what they observed and they looked at it a much more uh, biochemical perspective. Um, and so I think they might have mentioned the particular protein actors, but I'm not 100%. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. You said this is significant for study on cancer cells. Uh, have you looked at them? Because it seems like you induced a lot of breaks. Uh, do you know what's sort of typical in a cancer cell? Uh, yeah, so we were definitely working with, we were working with HeLa cells, which, you know, are already pretty cancerous. Um, so I think we, we think of this more as this is related to cancer in that, you know, all cancer is sort of eventually is derived from, or most, most cancers are sort of derived from unrepaired damage that sort of leads to the mutations that, uh, you know, leads to cancer. And so we sort of think of our research as basic research that's understanding what are the mechanisms that are related to how this damage is formed and repaired properly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, which of course leads down to uh, different types of cancers. Uh, I, uh, yeah, in terms of how, I mean, I think you could probably, I mean, we're causing a lot of damage because we're looking at how damage is sort of working, but I think there's been some, we've sort of talked about the idea that you could at least locate damage in, you could locate the areas where you have damage in one of your cells just by looking at the chromatin compaction profiles within your uh, cell nucleus. And so maybe that might not necessarily help treat cancer, but if you're trying to, in a more clinical section, clinical, uh, uh, in a more uh, clinical aspect, trying to locate where you have damage without actually having to uh, do an assay for it, this might be one way you could do it using microscopy setup. Okay. Yeah, I was just more interested in the statistics if you knew them. Uh, uh, so I see there's another question from Drew. Oh. Yeah, so I had a question about um, the type of, so uh, related to the type of breaks and the behavior you see with mobility. So you use one type of chemical stimulus to create a certain type of break. And, you know, there's a diversity of different uh, break types that you can get, which might recruit different machinery. Um, so could you comment on maybe the universality of this phenomenon uh, or if you looked at this type of thing? Um, so yeah, we, we've only used neocarcinosatin, uh, but I'm pretty sure that it causes similar double strand breaks that sort of, uh, I think you would find from different kinds of radiation or, uh, even like CRISPR generated breaks. Are you talking about different kinds of double strand breaks? Or are you talking about like different other types of damage inside the cell, like single strand and the like and, mut and single point mutations? And maybe just different. I guess I was thinking about how when you get maybe you, there's different types of breaks where you have a clean double stranded break or maybe there are some mm -hmm. overhangs or asymmetric oh. overhangs or, you know, other chemical addicts which can form um, uh, associated with breaks and whether you think the behavior might be different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would love to comment on that, but that's, that's uh, the, that's kind of beyond uh, my knowledge base of, uh, yeah, I, I uh, at least within the literature, within the double strand break literature, there doesn't seem to be that much differentiation between talking about the different kinds of, or at least from the mobility perspective, the different kinds of if you have overhangs versus clean double strand breaks. Um, and so that wasn't something we were really looking at. Uh, yeah, at least, yeah, I at least in the literature with regard to mobility, I don't think, at least based on what I read, I don't think there's gonna be large differences in how that mobility works. But obviously, you know, with the different cascade, I'm pretty sure there are a few extra proteins that are sort of recruited in to sort of help clean up those overhangs. Um, but that's more in the biochemical side and I'm not really uh, qualified to speak on that. <laughs> Thank you though. And with regard to the previous question, uh, I think I don't remember who was asking about the asking about the statistics about the amount of damage that you see in sort of a healthy cancer cell. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even in uh, with, I'm sorry, I sort of that was for some reason that part of the question just skipped my mind. Uh, we do actually see in even our control cells, uh, some have a fair number of basal breaks. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, 
but of course we're also dealing with you know quite cancerous cells um i mean often our cancer and our control cells will find like maybe two or three large control basal breaks by large i mean like the post the focus is very large which it just might be that the one is sort of aggregating in some sort of pool um mm -hmm. but occasionally i will also find hela cells that have as much damage as my damaged cells, or at least look like they do, um, which was a little surprising to see, but we usually throw those ones out um, for our control analysis because, um, you know, <clears throat> yellow cells are pretty cancerous. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for answering that. Uh, so there's another question from Atreya Day. Uh, would you uh, take it away? Uh, hi, a very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, like, as the brakes are repaired, does the dynamics return to what they were previously? Have you have you observed this? Do the dynamics return to where they were previously? Um, so I have done some uh, time lapses. So all, all of my data was basically taken two or three or one, 30 minutes to three hours after damage. And at least for the type, for the amount of damage that I was causing, because it turns out we're causing quite a lot of damage. Uh, the cells were not able to repair all that damage in the course of the three hours. They were not able to get back to where they were. Um, I would say I've looked at some time lapses where uh, for, to like kind of figure out how long it would take for the cell to repair that level of damage. Um, and sort of with like 500 nanograms of NCS or at least 500 nanograms per milliliter, uh, after even 12 hours, they had not fully repaired. So uh, I think that would actually be interesting, but at least for the purpose of the experimental app, being able to do that kind of being able to image the same cells 24 hours after damage is an, a very different experimental setup than was sort of what i was working on um so uh i imagine if it's able to fully repair which i would sort of they might i, I imagine some fraction of the cells would i based on what i've read in the literature you would expect that they would return to normal Thanks. Uh, did I? I think you're on mute right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you. I, I, I just wanted to say I think there are no further questions, so we just wanted to thank you one more time. And uh, so we're about five minutes ahead, um, but I think we can. If no one's opposed to it, we can just continue on and maybe have a little bit longer break um, uh, after the next speaker. Okay, I don't see any thumb. They don't have a thumbs down. They only have a thumbs up here. So I'm assuming that's total agreement. Uh, so if we could uh, slowly queue up uh, the next talk uh, on, it's gonna be on fast CRISPR uh, on, camp, on demand, and that's gonna be from Yang Wu at the John Hopkins University. Hi everyone, my, na my name is Yang Liu a postdoc from TechGP Hall Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Today, I'm going to share with you our work on very fast CRISPR on demand. This work has been published last week. Uh, if you're interested, please make sure to check it out. My research is focused on Cas9 media genome editing. Cas9 is RNA-guided uh, DNA nucleus. It can target or binds to genomic DNA targets with at, at least nine nucleotide uh, base pairs between the guide and the DNA. To cleave the DNA, it requires more than 15 to 16 nucleotides. Once the Cas9 makes the cut, the double strand break is introduced, and this is where the DNA repair is initiated. There are two major pathways responsible for the repair of double strand break. One is called an AGJ. The yeah, other is uh, HDR. In HJ, insertion deletions are easily introduced. In HDR, the template is, up, is required. Although there are much no, or these two pathways have been widely uh, harnessed for gene ed genome editing, there are still many interesting questions remain, uh, especially regarding to the dynamics of these pathways. For example, when does uh, DNA repair start upon DNA cleavage? How long does the DNA repair last? 
And if or when this you know, uh, restructure or chromatin remodeling occur? Uh, to answer those questions, we thought a highly inducible Cas9 system will be desired. Um, here we're introducing our system named, we termed as very fast CRISPR. As you remember, I said nine nucleotides is required for uh, Cas9 bind to uh, the target DNA. Therefore, here we use chemical cage group to block the end, the distal end of the guide arm. Therefore, the protein and the guide arm can only partially base pair with the target DNA. It still stably binds, but no cut can be made. Not until you shine the light, cage molecule falls, and then the partial base pairing proceeds to full base pairing, and then cut can be made, as well as the downstream uh, events. We speculate these uh, pre-bind states will save the time of Cas9 DNA targeting searching and accelerate the downstream genome editing steps. To test this hypothesis, we run this uh, gel shift assay. In the, lane, the, the first line, we have DNA only, it's about 400 BP. Second line, we add in the Cas9 RMP, uh, it will ship uh, the band shipped up. Without light, we treated these, the second sample, where protein is K, the DNA shifts back. These results support the idea of cast, uh, very fast CRISPR stably bounds the DNA, but does not cleave without light stimulation. Uh, what about the light, light dependent cleavage? So here we shine the light, you see after five to 10 seconds, we achieved over 50% of the cleavage activity. And then without light, you don't see much. We also demonstrate this in cells. We measure the double strand break percentage in hex cells at the gene called MIC. We show that we can achieve over 50% of double strand break at this locus 30 seconds after light stimulation. Compared to other state-of-the-art and useful Cas9 system, uh, we significantly increase the cleavage kinetics from hours scale to second scale. There are some several other features of our system. It is highly efficient in the editing. We show indel at different locus with over 90% efficiency. In the paper, we also demonstrated the minimal toxicity and the reduced off-target effect. Here, given the time, I'm not going to talk about detail about these features. And instead, I will focus on brand very fast CRISPR as a new tool to study the dynamics of uh, DNA double strand break repair. There are several powerful techniques in the literature. And uh, here, we believe the very fast CRISPR combines the power or the advantage of uh, each method which I mean is we very fast group allows you to generate double strand break in a very clean fashion. And you have unlimited pool, almost unlimited pool of genomic locus for choice. And you can achieve very fast second scale uh, time resolution and high efficiency. And uh, you can get all these benefits uh, in one technique. With all these tech, uh, advantages. We believe it allows us to study uh, the dynamics of DNA repair, especially focusing on the early uh, time scale uh, within a few minutes. In the canonical DNA repair, it is believed that after damage is made, DNA repair protein will be recruited very quickly, for example, mRNA complex, ATM kinases to phosphorylated H2OX. Okay. Downstream factor protein will also be recruited to complete the repair. Therefore, we believe maybe Cas9 will be served as a very accurate timer to, uh, to measure these processes. Here we're going to demonstrate these, uh, uh, how we do it by measuring the, uh, the kinetics of MR11 recruitment, 53 pp one and we're going to also investigate the phosphorylation kinetics of H2X. 
To do that, we decided to combine our VF CRISPR with another powerful technique named uh, ChIP-seq. But we're going to do it in a time-resolved fashion. So ChIP-seq allows us to investigate DNA sequences bound by a specific uh, protein of interest. Here we are going to shine a light at time zero and the fixed sample at this uh, later time point sequentially. Okay, and then we're going to process sample and profile the protein uh, of interest. So first we're going to look at the recruitment of MR11, which is now uh, MR11 as part of mRNA complex that we recruited to the DNA damage site upon cleavage. As you can see, at no, when, in the no light case, you don't see any DNA reads bound with the MR11. But two minutes after that, you see a small peak, and it, which gradually increases and uh, almost peaked at 15, 20 minutes. You get this information from the plot. So this is a very striking result because it contradicts with the vast majority of the in vitro data that shows that Cas9 stays uh, stable bound after cleavage to Cas9 stable bound to both DNA ends. If we look closely to the reads, we also found that certain MRE11 protein binds to DNA reads that cross the cut site. This data suggests that MRE11 binds even after the repair. And the repair can occur as fast as 15 minutes. In that case, we analyzed the kinetics of uh, phosphorylation H2X. H2X is a, it's a special histone variant. And uh, it responds to the DNA damage. After we shine a light, we see the phosphorylation signal increases, and both in amplitude and in width. So we, uh, we for the first time, we quantify the spreading of the width uh, after Cas9 cut, we show that the phosphorylation can span uh, at 150 kb uh, per minute, which is uh, very fast. In another case, we would like to show you we, uh, how we uh, monitor the DNA damage repair uh, using imaging method. This allows us to analyze uh, or to reveal some of the DNA repair dynamics uh, from cell to cell or even allele to allele. To do that, we're targeting a gene called PPYR2, it's a single cut with the VF CRISPR. Uh, to monitor this, the site of the damage, we use a repetitive region that's not far from the cleavage site. But this, we can use a truncated guide, so cut is not made, so it's only for visualization. And to monitor the repair Dynamics, we use 53 BP1 and Cherry as a reporter. Therefore, you will see a colocalization between the BP and the Cas9 GFP when the damage is, uh, is detected. So this is a typical movie we, we got. Uh, so we shine the light time zero, and they can track the formation of these highly dynamic foci of BP over hours. If we take a close look at the movie, you will see the data is very is highly rich. You can see the start of the foci, see how long it lasts, when it ends, and then interestingly, we see multiple rounds of uh, appearance and disappear. Uh, take these images, we're able to extract the intensity traces and analyze uh, or even model the process uh, more accurately. So you can see this the starting point T1 uh, for this allele and how long does it last for the dual time here. So using a two-step model, we extract that uh, the Cas9 induced DSP is often detected. It is detected at the scale of about 10, uh, 12 minutes. So what about the dual time? Uh, as I show, as it shows cyclic. We found that the first round of repair uh, takes longer, typically at a range of two to three hours, but the following round of repair is uh, shorter. If you treat the sample with the DNAPK inhibitor, which inhibits the NGJ, and you drastically increase the dual time to six, seven hours. Uh, we believe this data supports the idea of different cycles of BP suggest a different cycle of uh, repair. So when BP shows up, it's detected, 
when repair is gone and repair is finished. And uh, if you, interestingly, I, when we use the DNA PK inhibitor, we mostly just show, see one round of VP recruitment and just last for uh, the entire imaging session. Okay, so I already demonstrated that how we utilize this uh, improved or second scale uh, uh, time, time control for studying DNA damage repair. But next I would like to show how we want to push the boundary of uh, Cas9 activation with a spatial control. In this way, we can have a nicely control in genomic coordination, coordinates, time, and space. So to do that, I'm going to use a focus laser beam that will only target one allele out of two copies in the same nucleus. So we're going to do subcellular activation. First, we're going to target a repetitive locus that consists of hundreds of copies of the Cas9 with the VF CRISPR target. So, so shine on one, but not the other. And we're going to monitor the BP recruitment. So this is a typical movie. You see we shine light on the magenta. You see the BP recruit there, uh, but not the other one. So uh, it's very clear. This is the time uh, intensity trace. OK, so that's the repetitive locus. We can also do this for a single cut at a single gene locus. Again, this is the pp 1 2 gene. We are using the reference site, highly repetitive reference site, uh, just for visualization. Again, we are talking to one allele. You see we're talking the magenta and the 53 b 4 only localized to there, but not the other. So we repeated this for hundreds of cells for both repetitive locus and the single gene locus. We show that for uh, both uh, cases were able to achieve uh, single allele specificity. So uh, with all this, I would like to say we demonstrate that we can use the VF CRISPR for uh, applications in studying DNA damage repair, especially the dynamics part. And in principle, with the improved spatial uh, control, we may be able to achieve single allele editing in the future, or maybe uh, improve or eliminate the off-targeting effects of the Cas9 uh, physically uh, by using light. At the end, I would like to make my acknowledgement. I'd like to thank my advisor, Techju Pa, and uh, my co-advisor, Dr. Bin Wu, uh, for their support. And I would also like to thank my co-first author of the project, Roger. Uh, well, uh, they all made significant contribute to contribution to the project. Uh, I would also look, like to thank uh, other uh, project members, uh, especially Dr. Digvijit Sin for the initial demonstration of the system. And i also like to thank all the funding agencies. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions from you guys. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. That was a, that's beautiful work. I'm sure there are going to be several questions. So uh, let's start already with Bill uh, Earnshaw. Yeah, so one of the things that struck me is extremely interesting. Why is it when you inhibit DNA PK, you only got one cycle of cutting? So our speculation is that uh, DNA PK, and we have data also showing that we treat the sample with DNA PK inhibitor. Uh, you prevent the ligation process of the free DNA ends. So uh, uh, there are other data, there are the literature shows that uh, 53 BB1 seems like safeguards the, uh, the genome during the repair process. So we, we think maybe uh, our data suggests that uh, the BP will goes away after DNA gets ligated. So with the inhibitor, no ligation then BP just stays there. But why should the cast? Uh, um, okay, all right. Great. Um, are there any other uh, questions, comments? I think we'll uh, then continue on. Benicius Con uh, Contesoto from Rice University is going to talk to us about 
energy landscapes or exploring the energy landscape of chromosomes in the transitions from interphase and mitotic phase. Uh, I am Vinicius Contessoto, a postdoc fellow at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics at Wright University. And today I'm going to show you this ongoing work about uh, we are trying to explore a landscape of chromosomes, try to understand how chromosomes change shapes through the cell cycle. If you're considering that 95% of the living time of a cell, uh, it passes in the interface, which is basically prepare yourself to mitosis, where it's the cell division, you can see that your genome passes through a lot of different transitions which means your chromosome, they, they uh, change the shapes and there's a lot going on here. You can imagine uh, it was reported around 4,000 different proteins uh, acting in this whole process. And this includes, of course, uh, condensins and top isomerases too, which you know that they play an important role uh, in this process for doing the chromosome condensation and uh, remove some kind of entanglements and remove knots, uh, which could appear. So the idea it is there's a lot of things that we already know about such process, but uh, the major key points is still unclear. Uh, so to try to figure this out, uh, recently, uh, Jopper Deck Lab, they came out with this very nice synchronized high C experiments where they can have and get those uh, maps in different time points through the cell cycle for, for these different phases, right? So the major key points uh, that I could point out here it is uh, they were able to follow the loss of the compartments uh, when you advance to the pro-meta phase. And if you check a, the scaling of your polymer, the contact probability as a function of genomic distance, uh, each color here is different time points. Uh, you can see how they change, they have different inclinations. So this gives you an idea uh, how the shape of chromosome should be. Okay, so uh, I will point uh, the difference between those two, one in the interface and one at the 15 minutes, the pro meta phase. Uh, so this little bump here that you can see in the scale of the pro meta phase, which is related to the second diagonal that you can see, at the high C maps. So this was also a very nice finding that every uh, after this event of the nuclear envelope to break down, then you have the action of a condensed one, and then this is related to this to, to this bump. Okay, so how can we explore and use this experimental data to build some uh, physical models? Uh, I will talk about, a little bit about this uh, micro model, which it is the minimal chromatin model, which was successfully employed in interface human cell lines. Okay, so the motivation to build such model was, what's the minimum information that you need uh, to create a polymer which looks like a chromosome that are able to reproduce high C maps, uh, all those ensemble of structures. Okay, so basically this potential uh, micro uh, has a typical homopolymer potential with bonds, angles, excluded volume. And then here are uh, those assumptions, those uh, two terms which came from the maximum entropy approach, which it is first, what we call the ideal chromosome, which it is a lengthwise compaction term, uh, which acts for the whole chain, which is responsible to get to the correct scaling or the compaction of your polymer. Uh, another one, it is what we call types, which the name tells you it's related to the chromatin types A and B, where we can extract this data from the, the first arcing vector uh, from your high C map. So basically, uh, the only information that we 
we use from the experiments are the high C data. And then we will have our polymer model on top of those high C maps. And then you need to minimize and get to those parameters here, gamma and alpha. So after you go a few iterations and minimizing, um, those parameters to be uh, as much as similar as you can from the high maps. Uh, we can say that the, the potential is converged, and I will show you uh, what the result should, like, should be. Um, if you check here on the bottom uh, of this high C map, are the results from the simulation and an average over 500,000 structures. Uh, on top, you can see a the experimental results. So this is the results from the interface of the same chromosome seven that they show uh, in their paper. So we are able to reproduce uh, these high C maps and consequently, uh, we are also able to get the, the correct scaling. Uh, using this both information, if we have the high C, of course, then the scaling, we are able to get some representative structures from your interface chromosome. Okay, so the color is here, blue to red, go from the head to the tail, and the chromosome one, uh, seven in the interface, it uh, look like this is fear, where you have some kind of coil and uh, helix formation. It's called, um, quite interesting. And then we did the same approach for the chromosome in the prometaphase uh, in the 15 minutes. And this, in a similar way, we also were able to get the, the high C maps, uh, particular for the second band here, um, and which reflects that we are able to get the correct scaling, uh, particular for this, this little bump here, which is the action of condensed one, uh, and the representative structure that we got, it's something which is looking like a, a microscopy uh, chromosome, this kind of rod shape. Uh, and I wanted to point out, it is that we have no, uh, no wall here, no cell wall, no any kind of uh, confinement potential. So the polymer is completely free to assume the shape that they're supposed to get, okay? So uh, here uh, on the the prometaphase chromosome, I just wanted to to see if you can if you can get that we have this also this heat formation and the colors from the head to the tail. You can see the formation of those small layers here. So we will try to quantify this uh, in the in the next slides, which it is. Uh, we are calculating this orientation order parameter, which basically you get two segments, uh, two low size, uh, uh, and then the vector connecting them, those segments, and then you try to see uh, through the whole chain uh, how the signal goes. Uh, and then for the interface, you can see this kind of oscillatory behavior. Uh, which goes through the whole chain, uh, and then the same happens for the prometaphase. Okay, so you also have those small oscillations, it looks like kind of a radio signal, and, and then if you look close to the prometaphase, you can kind of see that we have a big major wave here, right? So besides those little oscillations, you have a big one uh, which go over the whole chain as well. So how can we can get those numbers uh, for that? We did a Fourier transform uh, on those signals. And then the peaks here, uh, in average, tells us that uh, we have one turn every 320 kilobase in the interface. Okay, so every, this average about 300 KB, we have one turn on this heat formation on the interface. For the pro metaphase, uh, we found a higher frequency of this heat formation, which is around 250, uh, and in average, which go over the whole chain as well. Uh, and interesting, we found a 
another um, big peak here, which is in average around uh, four megabits per turn, which is related to that big wave that we saw in the previous figure. So the small oscillations, it's a high frequency one, which is this, uh, the 250 kilobits, and the big one was this related to the four uh, megabits. And if we do a coarsening view of uh, this structure, uh, what we observe is this major uh, turns here where they call those those layers in your chromosome, right? So uh, it, this is the way that your chromosome organize uh, by layers. So just to, to make my, my point clear, uh, so green here is a the actual polymer that we are simulating, and in red is just this coarsening view that it's, uh, we can say that it's the backbone uh, formation of this, this chromosome in four megabase uh, spacing. Okay, so we tell this that we have a helix of a helix formation. Okay, so uh, trying to quantify uh, those ellipticities, uh, we decided to measure if is there any kind of preferential chirality for, for such terms, okay? So for this, we calculated the cross product between two segments, and this basically tells you if your index is too easy for the right hand or the left hand, and we plot this uh, parameter uh, as a function of a genomic distance, so in blue is when you have right third, and in orange uh, is when you have the left third. And then this also has some kind of oscillatory behavior. So if you check the structure here on the top right, you'll see that um, those thirds, right or left, they are kind of mixture through the whole structure uh, that we could tell that we didn't find any preferential identity in, in this in this uh, resolution. So the frequency uh, of those numbers tell us about this, right? So you have basically the same population to the left or to the right uh, F, uh, at uh, 250 KB. So we did the same for this uh, coarsening structure and then uh, you have a left rand chirality uh, most of the time, and then for some reason, the chromosome find a kind of a structural defect, and then they twist and start to, to, to bend to, to another direction. So I just wanted to add uh, that all the tools that we use here in this work and the previous work at the center, we are making this available here at ndb.rice.edu, which it is this nucleon data bank. So the major idea is that we are storing uh, simulation and experimental data for 3D structures of chromosomes. So for the simulations, you, we already have terabytes of data there, and we have all the experiments about the DNA tracing data. We are all, it's also there. And on the software tab, you can get micron parameter to run using Gromax with a, a, a tutorial with all the, the scripts to, to do the analysis. And we also have a visualization tool. And please, if you have any kind of data that you want to share, you want to deposit it there, you are welcome to do it. So just send me an email. Okay, so about this visualization tool, you are able to track uh, chromosomes trajectories. Uh, you can also uh, load 1D chip seek tracks from encoded databanks and uh, overlay the 3D structures. So it's also to see where you have the peaks, you have more intense of colors here. It's good to see the difference between those history modifications or any kind of chip seek track or data uh, that you, you might have. 
Okay, so with that, I wanted to acknowledge um, people from CTBP, Professor Ornoshik, Professor Wolonitz, and Ryan Chain, which is now looking for a faculty position. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Michele Di Piero, which just started his lab at North Northwest University, and then between uh, Aria, Esteban, and Mateus. So, and of course, you for your attention, and thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. And I'm sure that there are going to be many questions that's already popped up. So I think first up was, uh, was William. You can unmute your mic. Thank you, thank you, yes, uh, very interesting. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, uh, first I have a, one small comment. And that is the genetic data show that the spiral is the helix is due to condensin two, not condensin one. Uh, anyway, uh, when you see that spiral in prometaphase, what's the radius of it? Thanks for the question. Uh, I didn't quantify that yet. Uh, what I what I could say it is uh, it's changed around two or three folds in, in the length. And it got um, thinner, but I don't have the numbers uh, for that. And when you saw, when you showed us the change in handedness of the spiral, was that uh, was that a map against a real chromosome, a real sequence? And if if it was, I'm wondering, did the change in handedness happen at the centromere? Uh, okay, so if you understood your question well, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, we got the, the data from a uh, from those high C maps, and then to use to train the parameters using that model, which uh, we have based those assumptions about the phase separation, and, and then this uh, this ideal chromosome which go for the whole chain. So for the central there. Uh, we didn't have any particular interaction for that because in the, during the high C maps, though, though data is not available because you know there's a lot of repetition, it's hard to get the information there. So for that, we we say that uh, we have a specific uh, uh, energy interaction which we call uh, no annotated, which uh, uh, it's just don't, don't go over the, the minimization processes. So in a sense that we don't have any particular interaction for that, so it's hard to tell what's happening with the centromere or uh, the, the rest. Okay, thank you. Thanks, sorry for, for the connection. And okay, we have another question from uh, Yi Feng Ki. Hi, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting talk. Um, I, I just have two questions. Uh, the, the first one is, um, is um, I just want to make sure, like when you, when you build up the model of the interface and metaphase chromosomes, uh, are you using the, like the same potentials, but uh, basically just uh, parameterizing differently from, from different high C? Is that, is that true? Yeah, so they're stood uh, really correctly. So we have the same potential form for both polymers, for both uh, 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 cell phase. The right. only thing that changed are those parameters. So as I you see. can see uh, from the experiments or the simulation, you see that the, the compartments or the, the term related to the phase separation, they kind of, they, they decrease uh, the difference between them. So they basically almost fade away. Right, so, so actually just, I ask that because um, um, because of the the, the other confusion is, is that uh, it seems like uh, you have those sub compartment types in, in your in your potentials, um, but uh, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, you know um, those sub compartment types are specifically identified uh, with the interface high C. Or I mean, th those are those are probably. Um, better identified with the interface high C. And, and um, I just wonder whether like, you know, um, you can successfully identify those sub compartments equally well uh, as those being identified from, uh, you know, 
metaphase compared to the interface and uh, you know if, if there is kind of a difference in the quality of those subcompartment identification um, then like how, how, how could you like deal with that in, your, in the model okay yeah this is a very good point uh, so for that uh, we use the eigen vectors from the, the interface chromosome just to say who will be A or B in, in our model. And then we keep this, uh, this for the whole uh, other cell phase. So, but what, what will be changing will be the energy parameter between them. So what we see at the interface, A and B, they are very distinguished, right? So B likes more to be with B, and then they phase separate uh, related to A's. And then once you advance to the prometaphase or so on, uh, what you see that uh, the difference between them are not that, um, not that sharp, it's not that clear. So they almost became the same and then they cut off the mixture uh, and then the energy parameters, uh, the difference is almost no exist. Okay, um, sorry, I, I might just have another small question. Like just, want, sure. just wanted to make, make sure is that um, you, you, you mentioned you didn't really apply any uh, confinement effect onto your either metaphase or interface chromosome. Um, mm -hmm. I just I just wonder if because uh, it might make sense because your sim your 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 system is um, is a, a subset of uh, a, just a part of the chromosome on, on an individual chromosome. So so it might make sense to do that, but just wonder wonder uh, whether like because of metaphase um, I think um, the uh, nuclear boundary should also have some effect on the metaphase. I mean, even even more yeah. important. Um, I'm just like wondering whether your shape of the metaphase chromosome would be largely if, uh, affected if you somehow like apply those um, confinement effect. I, I mean, maybe like um, another way to ask this is like, what what's the reasoning of, of not using um, the confinement, especially in the metaphase? Um, Case. Yes, uh, definitely uh, the neighboring and uh, other interactions with the, the, the cell wall or even uh, with the other chromosomes may affect. Uh, so the strategy that we, we use was uh, let, let's uh, just have our polymer free to move uh, and get to the shape that he, he wanted to see based on the high C. And then if, you, if we have any kind of interactions uh, happening in a real cell, they should reflect a little bit in the high C and then we kind of be able to get it. But definitely we could expand the model to kind of include such interactions and see uh, how the shapes could change or uh, if you can observe anything uh, more, uh, more interesting there. But the motivation is only this, to get our polymer free to, to, to get any shape without any kind of restraints. Can I make a quick? Can I make a quick comment, please? Just yeah, all quick, right. So, first of all, in metaphase, there's no nucleus, right? So, uh, in, in in vertebrate cells, the nuclear envelope is broken down. But there are two things that are going on. So, when the chromosomes are forming during prophase, they are in fact forming on the inside of the nuclear envelope. So, a boundary is appropriate there. But something completely different is going on in metaphase that I think no one is modeling. And that is that the chromosomes are also interacting with the microtubules of the mitotic spindle, which are growing and shrinking. And so they're mm -hmm. pulling and pushing the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. So the, chrom the solu sort of the solution of chromosomes is being stirred by the spindle as soon as the nuclear envelope breaks down at the beginning of prometaphase. Uh, how, how you model that into your calculations, I don't know. No, no, not so far. Uh, for, right. for the metaphase, of course, we don't have it. And for the prometaphase, uh, uh, as I say, that we don't have any of those uh, uh, additional options there. Yeah. All right, there is another question Thank coming you. in from uh, Atre uh, uh, the Day. Uh, hi, I was wondering in the mitotic chromosome model, like how did you take care of the condensins, like the loops because of condensins? Uh, okay, yeah, so thanks. Uh, so we don't have any of those those loops information in, in a particular form in the model. But what we do, it is uh, we not investigate the, uh, what is causing, but we are looking at what's the, what was the cause. So we look at the high C, and then we see what was the effect of what we have in those motor there. And then we have no activity or any other uh, dynamic part in this, 
we only do chemical dynamics just to be clear, but we model this in this uh, phenomenological potential, the ideal chromosome, which uh, in our assumption should get those motor activities in a, uh, uh, in a effective potential in a, in, in to do this modeling. So we don't have actually those motors acting explicitly in the in the in our polymer. Okay. Okay. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Michaela, you just uh, signed on for, for the question. Yes, I, I, I kind of wanted to um, answer William's question. So the, the, the beauty of inverting the high C is that whatever is the effect of the models, the microtubules, the envelope should be reflecting into the high C data. And what Vinicius is doing is inverting those high C data according to a model. And this model has different pieces, but still, he's inverting data. So if there's an effect of the microtubule, it should be in the high C. And if there's an effect of the uh, nuclear envelope breaking out, it should be in the high C. And that's sort of this, the beauty of having this agnostic approach, in which we just invert the data. That's only my only five cents. Thank you. All right. You know, um, I think uh, there are no more hands being raised here, and we're right back on schedule. So then I think uh, we can go ahead and start uh, with the next speaker, uh, Quan Chi, uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. He's going to talk about from high C contact map uh, to three dimensional organization of interphase uh, human chromosomes. Uh, my name is Guang Shi. I'm a postdoc from Dave Thurman High School at UT Austin. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. Today, I'm gonna present some results on reconstruction of 3D genome organization. Uh, we recently put this work on BioArchive as well. Uh, if you are interested, you can check it out. Uh, our goal here is to develop a computational method to reconstruct a three-dimensional genome organization from experiment data. Uh, we want our model to be able to reproduce the experiment measurement, uh, the, in this case, the high C uh, contact map. And then it also should be able to capture the, uh, the heterogeneity in the uh, genome organization as well. Uh, currently, the most used experiment technique for studying genome organization is high C. Uh, presumably, the high C uh, experiment captures a, a, a contact event where two genomic loci come into proximity. Uh, this, is a, this is a typical contact map uh, from high C experiment where each element uh, represents the contact frequency of relative contact probability between a pair of loci, PIJ. However, in order to have a three-dimensional structure, we need to know the uh, distance between them, Rij, uh, or at least the mean value of that, which is noted as, uh, as a bracket notation here. So the power law, uh, the, sorry, the polymer physics told us that uh, there is actually a power law relation between uh, contact probability Pij and the mean pairwise distance Rij, uh, given by this relation where the value of alpha uh, depends on the nature of the system. It's, this suggests that uh, we can use this power law relation to convert uh, the high C contact map to, the, to a distance map. However, there is a, a problem associated with that uh, due to the heterogeneity of cell population. Uh, here, uh, this is an example where there are two uh, sub uh, population A and B uh, among the ensemble cells uh, in the high C experiment. Um, so in population A, the distribution of the distance between uh, two loci I and J is given by uh, the blue curve, and the yellow curve uh, is the same distribution, uh, but for population B. Uh, within each subpopulation, the power law relation between Rij and Pij uh, still holds. However, if you look at the whole population, uh, this power law relation does not hold anymore. Uh, we show this in our previous work where we demonstrate that uh, uh, there is actually uh, extensive heterogeneity 
among cell population uh, in terms of its uh, genome uh, genome structures, and uh, it it is a reason why there's a discrepancy between high C contactability and the uh, distance measurement from fish experiment. Uh, in this work, uh, we show that uh, the power law relation, although does not hold strictly uh, in a heterogeneous cell population, but it actually gives us a, a lower bound. What do I mean by that? Uh, suppose you calculate some uh, RIG value uh, from PIG using this power law relation, and the value you get is actually the lower bound for, uh, of the true value. That means the true value of the pairwise distance is either equal or larger than the inferred value you calculated. And uh, this uh, uh, can be actually uh, demonstrate in a special case where there's only two uh, subpopulation where um, uh, so that using the Jensen's equality we can prove that uh, our this power relation does have uh, does is a, a is a lower bound um, so this suggests that without further knowledge of cell population compositions it is reasonable to use this power law to infer uh, the distance matrix from the high C data so then we would like to apply this to the high C data. The, the next question is that uh, what alpha value should we use? Uh, we, we know the alpha value for uh, ideal polymer or self volume polymer. However, for uh, 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 chromosomes, it is not known uh, theoretically. Fortunately, in, uh, in this experiment work, the author measured the pairwise distance and compared those to the high C measured contact probability. And they found that uh, the pairwise distance RIJ and the contact probability PIJ does have a power law dependence. And uh, the value of alpha is uh, about four. Uh, we also confirm uh, this value using a simulation study uh, using a, a copolymer chromosome model. So once we have this power law relation and the value of alpha, we can straightforwardly convert the high C contact map to a uh, inferred mean distance map. And we believe this is a good starting point because it contains uh, the direct information about the distance between those sides. Uh, so the, when people think about the 3D structure, people usually uh, sometimes think of a, a unique uh, structure. This is true for majority of protein where there's a native structure exists. However, it has become, become more and more clear that uh, the chromosome conformation does not have a unique fold. Um, so that means that uh, if you look at the structure uh, for, for a chromosome among different cells, single cell, you, you, you will find that uh, they are all kind of different from each other. So our model should uh, uh, take this variation into the consideration as well. So the question is that can we get the ensemble of structure consistent with the experiment data? Uh, the starting point here is the, our mean inferred, uh, inferred mean distance matrix uh, calculated from the high C data. And we should uh, generate an ensemble of structure which, uh, uh, which uh, reversely uh, can give back our inferred distance matrix, right? So in principle, there are an infinite number of possible ensembles which can be consistent with our uh, target. Uh, here, we use the principle of maximum entropy to find the unique ensembles. So using the inferred mean distance matrix as our constraint, right? We can write down the corresponding maximum entropy distribution here, uh, where the left-hand side is the joint probability of coordinates of individual loci, xi. Uh, and uh, it can be written in this exponential form where the kij is the parameter we need to determine. And uh, the value of the kij can be determined from our constraint. Uh, using the classic iterative scaling method, we, get, we update the value of kij uh, at each, each iteration uh, using this formula. Uh, uh, at, after a certain number of iteration, we can uh, converge to a, a very good result. So here, uh, this is the comparison between the inferred distance matrix uh, and uh, our model. 
So the lower triangle is the inferred distance map computed from the high C data. And the upper triangle is the result uh, from the model. Uh, this shows that the distance map of the reconstructed structure uh, agree pretty well with our uh, target. And uh, this is a chromosome one, two, three, four. Uh, as you can see that uh, all of them have a pretty good agreement. Um, so here, uh, I sh uh, this is the typical com uh, chromosome conformation for this particular cell type. Uh, and uh, um, and also, so this is the typical, I mean, the radius of generation of each uh, structure is the average value of that ensemble. However, uh, you can also look at the vari variation of the RG. Uh, this is the distribution of the radius generation RG for chromosome 5 for this cell type. And as you can see that uh, some individual uh, chromosome conformation uh, has a much larger value of RG than the others. So that, uh, uh, this suggests that there's a large variation among individual conformations. Uh, to further demonstrate that, I, this is a movie where uh, the 1,000 individual chromosome uh, conformation are, are superimposed together, and the color encodes the genomic location along the genome, and you can see that uh, it captures the probabilistic nature of the uh, chromosome structures. Um, also, the reconstructed ensemble structure uh, captures a uh, segregation between uh, A, B compartments shown here. Uh, we can also overlay different uh, biological markers, such as the uh, individual genes, uh, RNA-seq or chip -seq data with our reconstructed structures. Here is the example where the ATAC -seq signal is overlaid with the structure, um, and you can see that uh, uh, the loci with high uh, ataxic rate uh, segregate with the loci with low ataxic rate. And uh, this segregation pattern is roughly consistent with the segregation between A and B compartments, which is uh, kind of expected because people believe that the A compartment uh, is related to gene expression and it should, have a, it should be more accessible so that it has a high, uh, higher ATAC uh, signal. Then the next question we ask is that um, uh, we want to look at the structure of uh, uh, chromosome from different cell type. Uh, I showed before that this figure shows that uh, the conformation of a given chromosome is, uh, is highly heterogeneous, even in a single cell type, right? Uh, so the natural, natural question is that uh, if I give you a conformation for chromosome 5 from cell type 1, and uh, another conformation uh, from chromosome five, but from a different cell type. Can we actually distinguish them? Can you tell which co which conformation is from which cell type? This is a non-trivial question because uh, we actually have a large variation uh, among a, a chromosome structure, even in a single cell type. Um, so. By, so here is a result um, where uh, I first generate ensemble of structure for each uh, cell type. Uh, uh, and uh, then I use the TSNI to project the structure on a two-dimensional space. And this is result for chromosome 21. Um, and you can see that it's a different color, a different, uh, each point represent an individual uh, chromosome conformation. And uh, uh, it shows that a uh, different color occupy uh, these uh, distinct territories. And uh, especially for this three cell type, the blue, red, and green, they form a distinct cluster and also well segregated from each other. Uh, so this suggests that the, although there's a, a large heterogeneity uh, among chromosome conformation in a single cell type, the difference in the heterogeneity of the uh, 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 same chromosome in different cell types can be nevertheless be quantitatively discerned. Uh, to conclude, uh, we use a polymer theory uh, and to show that the power law relation between contact probability and the dist pairwise distance is a good approximation. And using the principle of the maximum entropy, uh, 
uh, we can uh, generate an ensemble of chromosome structure consistent with the uh, mean pairwise distance. Uh, uh, in this work, uh, we are uh, directly uh, uh, infer this mean pairwise distance from the HiC data. Uh, uh, however, if we have the direct measurement of this uh, pairwise distance such, uh, from an image experiment, we can apply our uh, method on that as well. Uh, we also show that the single cell uh, chromosome structure are very heterogeneous. Uh, and uh, instead of it, this heterogeneity, uh, the chromosome of different cell type can be uh, nevertheless distinguished to a large degree uh, in terms of their 3D structure uh, using uh, manifold learning techniques such as TSNI. Um, with that, I would like to thank my uh, advisor, Dr. Uh, uh, Dave Surumalai, and all the group members here. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for, for a very clear and uh, presentation. And she didn't even. Excuse me? And we're open uh, for uh, uh, questions. So please just go into the participants list and uh, raise your hand. All right, um, we can, well, they're popping in and out a lot. So Bill, you're very fast. <laughs> I'm fast? Yeah, you're the first one up there. Okay, That's ask because away. I'm, it's because I'm in Scotland and I'm so close. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so you say that the, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that the, the structures are extremely variable and that's what I would expect from nucleus to nucleus, but there's something in, in our high C data uh, with Job Decker and Leonid Mirny in, in our science paper that, that really uh, confuses me or a little bit. And that is that when we look at cells that are arrested at a very specific place in the cell cycle, the pattern we see in the high maps becomes, high C maps becomes incredibly sharp, even though this is being done on a population basis. Um, I just wonder if you have a, a comment on that. So we see the sort of maps that everybody's used to seeing for the sort of the plaid structure outside the diagonal and high C in, 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 in log phase cultures. But when we look at G2 cells, that, that map becomes really sharp as though, it, there, as though there is an element of reproducibility. Uh, so do you mean the checkerboard pattern? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, uh, um, so the checkerboard patterns, people believe it's uh, related to the, uh, the segregation between A and B compartments. So if I, I would imagine if you see, if you observe that it become more clear or more prominent, that means that just uh, suggests that at least uh, in an in a average sense, the segregation, uh, the microphase separation between A and B compartments become more uh, more strong. It's the, but uh, I'm not um, I'm not yeah. sure. So I follow the, the the question regarding the in, in the in the context of variation. Uh, well, I, I'm not a polymer physicist, so it's a very it, it's a naive question. But I think your answer is probably right that the that those those distribution the variation between the various compartments varies across the cell cycle. So when you look at a, at a, at a bulk population that's not synchronized, it's, it's a little bit more smeared than when you see a population at one state, in one place in the cell cycle. But it just struck me that that seems to suggest that there is some reproducibility, but perhaps not in the conformation of the polymer, but perhaps in more in the association of these regions. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, uh, suppose you have a perfect uh, synchronization between the uh, same cell type. Uh, I would imagine like you get this high, very high, uh, 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 like get the same result every time you do the experiment. But uh, nevertheless, the high C is the uh, the contact map is from many many cells, right? So yeah. uh, it's still a, a average value where uh, in principle. It's hard to tell the variation just look by looking at high C. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I, guess, I think next was uh, Michela. You had your hand up. Yes. Um, okay, so thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. And 
it sort of highlights uh, some points of contest between our research. I mean, we've been pushing for this idea of ensembles for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we have a paper, so Ryan Chang is there, he's the next, so he's gonna ask you something. So Ryan has this paper in which we show that one way to look at the differences between the ensembles of different cell lines is looking yeah. at what kind of, if you look at the compartmentalization patterns, uh, you see that the microphases that are active, they tend to move toward the periphery of the nuclear territories. And that's one clear order parameters that's distinguishing different cell types. And, uh, and again, it's important to notice that in our case, we're not inverting the high data, we're using the epigenetic data to calculate these things. So we're making a, you know, a full prediction. And these this ensembles, they, they correspond to the ensembles we observe in high and in fish and in, uh, uh, you know, DNA tracing and so on. But the point is that I get to my question is your T is your, your order parameter that you're plotting on a low dimensionality, low dimensionality reduction. Can it be connected to anything similar to our order parameter that is moving active genes uh, uh, to the periphery or what does that parameter mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So I didn't uh, look at that particular um, aspect where how the how the how the a particular region changes uh, whether move towards the center or periphery depend on the cell type because the TSNI, uh, it's not a, uh, so usually it's not a one single collective variable. So um, I, we do look at some other collective variable which has physical intuition. Uh, such as the the degree of the se uh, segregation between A and B compartments in different cell type. We do see that also has some some difference between cell type. But uh, uh, so just look at look look at uh, one of few collective variable. Um, uh, sometimes it's hard to actually tell the cell uh, cell type apart from each other. So the T C is like a uh, um, uh, um, it's a manifold where it directly projects a high-dimensional object into a, onto a two-dimensional object. No, I understand. And in fact, we have struggled for a long time to find an order parameter that could distinguish yeah. a cell type from another. Yeah. And it's not easy. I mean, and uh, we tried many, we failed many. And then we found that if you look at a compartment, a, at a region, at a gene that is switching, from a compartment to another, so that it's changing its epigenomics. That, that gene is moving toward the nuclear periphery, not the nuclear periphery, toward the uh, chromosome periphery. Okay. And that's actually been observed uh, many times in, in experiments. So I was wondering if you can sort of confirm this finding with yeah, your that's inversion that are not prediction, but are inversion. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's a very suggestion. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Ryan, you had a question? Yes. I mean, uh, McKelly essentially uh, asked the key parts of what I was going to uh, ask, but um, I, I guess, you know, is there, in your last figure, which, which was, was very, I mean, your talk is very interesting. Uh, in your last figure, you basically do have, uh, according to your, your uh, order parameter, differences between the structural ensembles of the different, the chromosomes belong to different cell types. Yeah. I, I was wondering, you know, um, I mean, what, 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 uh, what physical intuition do you have regarding those differences? I mean, uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, in order to have some physical intuition, you need to have defined some collect variable like you did, right? Uh, which has a direct intuition. So we did, we do calculate the two particular variable first is the degree of the segregation between a B compartments uh, and the other is the uh, we call it the degree of the, fra uh, the, the degree of how how the, how the structure is uh, a fractal like uh, because of um, the, the concept of fractal globule is that uh, the low side uh, uh, close along the uh, genome uh, uh, genome ma uh, may also be uh, proximity in 3d space and we define some collective variable based on that concept. And we do find that the different cell type also have a different distribution of that collective variable. Uh, but like I said, if you just look at one, because the distribution is pretty wide, so when they overlap 
on each other just by looking at the distribution. Uh, if, you, I give, if, you get, if I give you the, the overlap the superposition of all the distribution together, you cannot tell them apart. Uh, the, the, um, Have yeah. you been able to corroborate any of this with um, like any, um, for example, RNA-seq data or any data regarding um, transcriptional activity or uh, anything like that? Yeah, I, I haven't done that. Yeah, so, so, so far we only look at the T uh, ataxy. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think there are no further questions, so let's thank uh, you one more time, Go on. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on now to our next and final speaker in the morning session. Um, I think I was told she has joined us, and that's going to be Gita. Nar Lakar uh, from UCSF, and she can will be speaking on can phase separation explain heterochromatin properties. Thank the organizers for inviting me to this virtual workshop, and then I'm excited to share our recent work on heterochromatin and phase separation. As many of us know, heterochromatin is a classic context to study genome compartmentalization. And shown here is one of the many ways in which heterochromatin is, is described, which is cytologically. If you take a mammalian cell and stain it for DNA, you see darkly stained regions that we term heterochromatin and lightly stained regions that we term euchromatin. Now, um, a highly conserved type of heterochromatin is mediated by the protein HP1. This, uh, at the heart of this type of heterochromatin is the complex form between the HP1 protein and chromatin that is methylated on histone H3 lysine 9. This type of heterochromatin serves many different functions. It represses transcription, it plays a role in repressing recombination, it is really critical for proper chromosome segregation, and it is really critical for conferring rigidity to the whole nucleus. And so the complex form between HP1 and, and chromatin uh, plays diverse biological roles. And one of our long-standing questions in the lab is how does HP1 mediated heterochromatin serve so many different types of roles in biology? Now, in addition to the, the many different roles that uh, this type of heterochromatin plays, there is also a long-standing apparent paradox in, in, in the field, which is uh, uh, sh captured by these two images. So on the one hand, if you look at heterochromatin domains shown by this darkly stained region, they seem to be stable in space over several hours and often over the lifetime of a cell. On the other hand, if you look at these study, older studies by Mistelli and Kiosis labs, what they found was if you can fluorescently label HP1 alpha and frap it in, within these bodies, HP1 molecules recover on the order of seconds. So somehow, the molecules that maintain these stable domains are highly dynamic and come on and off on the order of seconds. And so another longstanding question in the field has been, how are these stable compartments maintained despite the participant molecules coming on and off on the order of seconds? And to address these and other related questions, uh, we have been interested in understanding the biophysical mechanisms that underlie the functions and properties of hp one mediated heterochromatin. Now, before I describe what we've learned in the last several years, let me give you a proper introduction to the HP1 molecule. Um, this molecule has uh, two structured domains, a chroma domain that binds the histone mark, a chroma shadow domain that forms a dimer and a dimerization interface that binds hydrophobic motifs. Uh, it also has three unstructured regions, uh, N-terminal extension, a C-terminal extension, and a hinge that has positively charged residues, mainly lysines, that bind both DNA and RNA. Now, this dimeric architecture and this overall domain architecture of H1 molecules is highly conserved. It's conserved all the way from Palm B fission east to humans. In Palm B, the main H1 protein is called SY6. In humans, one of the main H1 proteins is H1 alpha. So using the Palm B uh, protein SY6, we learned several years ago that this protein can oligomerize across chromatin and oligomerization is enabled by a specific architecture of this molecule on chromatin, where four molecules of SY6 bind to a single nucleosome, creating sticky ends that form oligomerization interfaces. A little more recently, we found that the human HP1 molecule, HP1 alpha, can form phase-separated droplets. 
But in, in the process of forming these phase-separated droplets, it starts out from an auto-inhibited state in the absence of any ligands. When you add in DNA, it binds the DNA and then forms these uh, phase-separated droplets. We believe uh, binding of DNA opens up the auto-inhibited state because the hinge region, which is occluded in the auto-inhibited state, now becomes accessible due to DNA binding. And this allows the HPN alpha molecule to oligomerize and form the many multivalent interactions that are needed for phase-separated droplets. I want to point out that this phase separation behavior is seen in the absence of crowding agents and under physiologically relevant HPN alpha concentrations in the low micromolar reg uh, regime. Okay. We also learned in our earlier studies, in collaboration with Cy Redding's lab, that HPN molecules can dramatically compact DNA. Shown here is a, a DNA curtains assay uh, pioneered by Cy Redding's lab to look at HP1 molecules. What you see here are individual strands of lambda DNA attached at one end on a glass slide and stretched out by flow by buffer flow. And what you're going to see next is what happens to these lightly fluorescently labeled uh, DNA molecules when we add in HP1 molecules. Okay. This is what, what happens. In real time, these HP1 molecules are dramatically condensing the DNA on the order of seconds. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that HP1 molecules can oligomerize across chromatin, they can dramatically compact the DNA, and they can form phase-separated droplets. So combining these three features of biophysical features of HPN molecules, we, we have a very simplistic working model for how HPN molecules might enable the formation of structures in a cell. So in this model, multiple HPN molecules oligomerize on chromatin. And when they oligomerize on chromatin, the local concentration of HPN molecule goes up and dra dra can drive them into adopting a phase-separated state. Now, this phase-separated state uh, can then compartmentalize the chromatin and, and also shield the chromatin for, from things like RNA polymerase. Now, this is an um, attractive model because it is simple and intuitive, and it provides a, an explanation for how phase separation can uh, participate in genome compartmentalization. I also want to mention that our discovery of phase separation of H1 molecules happened in parallel with, with similar findings from the Carpent lab. Okay, so while this is intuitive and exciting, it is still somewhat superficial. And so in the past several years, what we've tried to do is to dig deep into the biophysical basis underlying phase separation by HPN alpha uh, with the goal of trying to understand what are the properties that phase separation can confer on heterochromatin, and can we learn something about how, from these properties about how heterochromatin might actually function in, in the cell. So what I'm going to share with you next for the rest of the talk are some of these in-depth biophysical studies, and these were carried out by uh, Madeline Keenan, a talented and brave graduate student um, uh, who is a joint graduate student between my lab and the lab of my colleague, Sal Redding. So everything I'm going to tell you for the rest of the talk is a close and complete collaboration with the Redding lab and has been led um, uh, very courageously by Madeline Keenan. So what Madeline wanted to ask was, what are the types of mesoscale properties that are enabled by phase separation of HP1? And, and to do this, she decided she would keep the system simple. She would only focus on how HP1 alpha interacts with DNA. Because our goal was to understand what are the intrinsic properties of the system so we could then build in complexity, such as adding chromatin. So for full disclosure, the rest of the talk does not have any chromatin in it. All I'm going to show you are Interact, uh, what HP1 alpha interacting with DNA can give you. And as you will hopefully see, even in the simple two-component system, we are uncovering unexpected properties of HP1 DNA phases. And underlying a lot of Madeline's questions was this basic biological question, which is how does dynamic HP1 binding result in stable and regulatable genome organization? So before... Um, before I get into um, some of Madeline's data, I just want to take a step back and ask, what do we mean by phase separation? Because we talk about this quite a bit in, in, in the field, in the literature. And when we try to describe phase separation to perhaps somebody who's not in the field or perhaps who's not a scientist, the example that often comes to mind is oil and water. Okay? And um, it, it's, a, it's a fair example, uh, and it's a, because it's an intuitive, intuitive and easy to ex explain example. So what happens in, in, when you have oil and water? Uh, oil molecules shown in yellow are very weakly solvated by water. They would rather interact with each other 
to form these oil droplets than interact with water. And these kinds of droplets are, are, um, have a, a few very defined features. Uh, droplets retain the oil molecules. The oil molecules don't come in and out that rapidly. And there's very little water in the oil molecules because again, oil is hydrophobic and water is not going to be solvated by the oil. Okay. So this is one type of phase separation that um, we can discuss. But physicists and, and, and chemists over the last decades, many decades, have found that you, phase separation comes in many, many types. Okay. And uh, it, you can have other types of phase separation that involve electrostatic interactions. And, and to give an example that is slightly diff quite different than oil and water, uh, I'd like to take the example of phase separation mediated by interactions between oppositely charged polyanions and, and cations. So what you have here is a system where you have polyanions uh, and polycations at a certain concentration in, in solution. And as you increase the concentration of these polyions above a certain critical concentration, they would rather interact with each other than with solvent and they can form phase separated states. Now these phase separated states are quite different than the oil and water phase separated states because polyions can diffuse in and out because they can, they can also be solvated by, by water. And the droplets that are, the phase separated droplets formed by the interaction between the polyions can contain water. And so if we look at these two types of phase separated systems and ask what does HP1 and DNA resemble more, uh, we believe it resembles more this, the, this latter type of phase separation system mediated by electrostatic interactions. Because um, phase separation in HP1, in the HP1 context, is mediated by the interaction of DNA, uh, negatively charged DNA, with the positively charged hinge. Now, in addition to being electrostatic, um, compared to other phase separation systems that rely on electrostatic interactions in biology, uh, interactions between HP1 and DNA have another feature that is quite different from other biological systems, which is the length of DNA. HP1 molecules have to organize kilobases to megabase level uh, regions of DNA. And when you get to that level of uh, DNA length, you now have to start thinking about the polymer behavior of DNA participating in the types of phases that are generated. So uh, Madeline set out to, to ask, does, HP, does the HP1 DNA phase separation system resemble this kind of uh, electrostatically driven phase separated system? And do the HP1 molecules diffuse readily in and out of these phases? And to do that, she used, uh, made a phase separated droplets using a fluorescently labeled HP1 molecules. So green HP1 molecules, unlabeled DNA. She formed green droplets, and then she frapped the whole droplet and asked, how readily does this recover? And what I'm showing you next is the movie of this, of this frap experiment. See the droplet is frapped, and this is real time. Within seconds, um, H1 molecules have recovered. Okay. Now what is interesting about this exp simple experiment is that you can see that there's a very small barrier to the entry and exit of H1 alpha molecules, yet the droplet maintains it in its integrity and shape. So this and other experiments I don't have time to show you, um, suggests that HP1 DNA, the HP1 DNA phase separation system more resembles the system I've shown on the right here uh, that is driven by electrostatics. And less so the system by, of oil and water where you have sharp boundaries and a real, uh, a, a real containment of the, the HP1 molecules. Okay, so having, having seen this in the context of um, HP1 and DNA, Madeline uh, next went on to ask, can she get to the core of the question that she set out to ask, which is how does dynamic H1 binding result in stable and regulatable genome organization? Okay. And for this, she chose these phase separated droplets that I've been describing as simple models for HP1 DNA territories because these droplets can contain DNA and we can study their intrinsic properties and, and very, very loosely model them as HP1 DNA territories. Okay. So you know, one of the first questions she asked was, um, what happens when two territories mix? Does the HP1, molecule, the HP1 content mix between these territories and does the DNA content mix within these territories? So the first thing she asked was what happens uh, to the HP1 content? And to do this experiment, she made two types of droplets. Um, green droplets with fluorescently labeled, green fluorescently labeled H1 alpha molecules and red droplets with red fluorescently labeled H1 alpha molecules. And in both of these droplets, the DNA 
was a long piece of DNA now, a 3 kV piece of DNA, and it was unlabeled. Okay? So these droplets required the, form, the presence of DNA. She formed green droplets, red droplets, mixed them for uh, about one and a half hours and waited and asked, what happens to, to the, do the droplets fuse? And if they fuse, do they exchange contents? If they exchange contents, we, we expect the droplets to become yellow because uh, both the, uh, all droplets would have green and, and red HPN alpha molecules. And that's what she says. Uh, this is what, how the droplets look after mixing and waiting for one and a half hours. All the droplets show uh, red, all the droplets show green, and all the droplets show yellow. Okay. And you can see even these two droplets that have just fused in the act of fusing have already become yellow. So we, uh, what, this, what this result said was that H1 molecules uh, exchange pretty rapidly between droplets when the droplets fuse. Okay. And that was not a surprise given the FRAP data that I just showed you. But the real experiment came when Madeline asked what happens to the DNA. And so for this, she, she, re, um, she did a parallel type of experiment where now she used unlabeled HP1 alpha molecules, but labeled DNA molecules. So you had green droplets with, uh, made with green fluorescently labeled DNA, red droplets made with uh, red fluorescently labeled DNA, formed the droplets, then mixed the two droplets and waited for one and a half hours and asked, does the DNA between these two droplets, when they fuse, does the DNA mix? Okay. So again, we're looking at the, the, the DNA, because the DNA is labeled, the HP1 is unlabeled. And this is what she sees. Okay. Um, this is after waiting for one and a half hours. She sees that most droplets are either red or green. And even all the droplets that fuse, the DNA remains in its territories largely. And this is again on the order of, of, of several minutes and up to a, an, an hour and a half. Okay. So what she sees is that, for example, you can look here, this droplet has been formed by the fusion of a, re a red droplet and a green droplet. Okay. We know from the previous experiment that H1 molecules have rapidly exchanged, yet the DNA remains in its territory. The red DNA remains in one territory and the green DNA remains in the other. There's a very low amount of mixing here, but nothing compared to the yellow that I showed you in the previous experiment. So DNA exchange much more slowly between droplets than HP and alpha. And you can see this in, in, in a different kind of movie where now you have pink DNA and green DNA, and you can see these droplets mixing, bumping into each other, fusing, and yet the DNA remains in its territories. And this goes on for the order of half an hour to an hour. Okay, um, so how do we explain this? Okay. How do we explain the phenomena that we are seeing that H1 molecules are clearly coming on and off on the order of seconds, yet the DNA is remaining in its territories on the order of hours? Okay. So here's where we could go back to uh, many of our findings from previous years, and we, we could use those to build a model. So we know that h molecules can oligomerize. We know that they can bridge across different parts of chromatin and different parts of DNA. And we know that h molecules, as shown by the curtains assay, DNA curtains assay, can dramatically compact the DNA. Okay. And so we have now a, a working model where h, h molecules, even though they're weakly bound, because they can oligomerize, they can cross bridge across DNA and form multiple interactions that hold the DNA in place and allow folding of the DNA into a small and compact territory. Now, uh, I mentioned DNA polymer effects earlier. The longer you make the DNA, the more viscous uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the solution is going to behave. And so we believe that as the DNA is getting longer, the viscosity of the solution is increasing. But HP1 molecules further cross-bridging the DNA and, and keeping it in a small territory further increases the effective viscosity of the system and keeps the DNA kinetically trapped in a small region. So to think about this, you can imagine any individual HPN molecule coming on and off on the order of seconds and exploring its surroundings and exchanging with the surroundings. But at any time, there will always be multiple HPN molecules holding the DNA down and uh, trapping it in a network of HPN um, uh, molecules so that the entire DNA molecule can very uh, where cannot readily sample uh, a solution space around it. Okay? And so just to summarize, we think that weakly bound H1 alpha oligomers bridge different regions of DNA, 
further increasing their effective viscosity and keeping them kinetically trapped in their own phase separated territories. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting here now in this model is that HPN molecules are not just behaving like the poly ions I described in the beginning. They're not just neutralizing the charge of the DNA, but they're doing something more. They're cross bridging and adding in additional interaction energy to hold the DNA down. If that's the case, we, we thought this might be reflected in the stability of the system. And to get a sense of the mechanical stability of the system, uh, what Madeline decided to do was to do a force pulling experiment. And to do this experiment, she collaborated with Lucy Brennan, a postdoc, joint postdoc in the labs of Cy Redding and Basim al Sadi at UCSF. And um, she also got a lot of uh, useful um, help with some controls from Roman Renger and Stefan Grill's lab. So here's the experiment. What, what Madeline and Lucy did was they took a long piece of Lambda DNA, they tethered either end to um, a, a bead that could be held in a laser in an optical trap. So both ends of this long piece of Lambda DNA are now tethered. They took this long piece of DNA, dipped it into a solution of HPN alpha, and that was fluorescently labeled, shown here in, in pink. And that results in the formation of a small condensate or a phase in the middle of the DNA because there's more slack in the middle of the DNA. So uh, it's easier to bend and fold the DNA in the middle of, uh, in the middle of the strand. And now what they're gonna do is they're gonna ask, what happens when we pull this polystyrene bead in the optical trap? How much force do we need to dissolve this droplet? Okay, and this is what they see. And what I'm showing you is the first few pulls of 10 successive uh, uh, pulling experiments. They're pulling, they're pulling. It's not coming apart. It's not dissolving. And what is nice about the setup is that it's highly quantifiable. I won't go through all the 10 successive pulls, but I'll show you the quantification. You can quantify the extension of DNA as a, as a function of the force applied. If there is no HP1 alpha droplet on the DNA, you see the black force extension curve. The DNA is extended and uh, above 40 piconewtons, it starts uh, unpairing. Okay, so they could not go above 40 piconewtons. But what you see here is what happens to uh, the system when you now have part of the DNA trapped in this HP1 phase. As you pull, you pull, the, the droplet does, you still have a large amount of DNA trapped inside the droplet, even at 40 piconewtons force. The droplet does not fall apart. And with each successive pull, as shown in this direction, going left to uh, right to left, it gets harder and harder to pull, uh, to pull the DNA. It's almost as though something is getting, getting tightened inside uh, the, the, the more often you pull, okay? So this is a really high amount of force, but how, how can we contextualize it? Even at 40 piconewtons, this droplet is not falling apart. Even though, remember, h one molecules are coming on and off on the order of seconds, okay? And to put it in context, um, uh, RNA polymerase stalls at 20 piconewtons, okay? And yet these little structures that we've shown here with just H1 alpha and DNA are stable up to 40 piconewtons. Okay? So what these studies were, uh, are now beginning to suggest to us is that what HP1 alpha DNA phases give us are mechanical structures that are, can form a barrier to polymerases, a mechanical barrier to polymerases. They can begin to explain how heterochromatin confers mechanical rigidity to the nucleus, and they can begin to explain how these kinds of phases might confer structural stability at kinetochores. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that these, stable, the, these uh, domains and territories are stable, in term, at least viewed from the perspective of DNA, they don't come apart. But in biology and development, you do have to break apart HP1 heterochromatin when you have to turn on a gene or during replication. So if these condensates are so stable to mechanical force, how might they be regulated? And so I'm going to end with one last experiment uh, where Madeline asked, can H1 paralogs be part of the answer? Okay, so, so far I've been talking about H1 alpha, but now I'm going to introduce H1 beta. H1 beta yeah, is, has similar sequence, uh, is largely similar to H1 alpha in sequence, but has a few small sequence differences because of which H1 beta does not form droplets with DNA and does not compact DNA. Okay. So what Madeline asked was, could HP1 beta, shown in green, act as a poison for HP1 alpha? So here's what she did. She made droplets with uh, green HP1 alpha, fluorescently labeled a DNA, shown here. 
sorry, not green, but, but orange, orange droplets. She then added in green HP on beta and asked what happens to these HP on alpha DNA droplets. And so this is um, what you'll see. You can see that HP on alpha droplets are dissolving, but before they dissolve, HP on beta shown by the green channel gets, in, channel gets into the droplets. Okay? So HP on beta is able to dissolve HP on alpha droplets by transiently entering the droplets. We believe it does show so by forming heterodimers that uh, interfere with, with uh, HP on alpha's ability to interact with DNA. Okay, so to summarize uh, what I've shown you so far, um, we think all of these biophysical properties of HP on alpha DNA condensates that we're discovering can confer biologically useful behaviors, okay? And what are these behaviors? They can give you DNA compartments that inhibit mixing of DNA, but allow mixing of HP1. This, could, uh, this occlusion of DNA may enable repression of transcription recombination. This, these kinds of phases can give you compacted DNA that is highly resistant to biologically relevant forces, and can ex begin to explain how mechanical rigidity is confirmed to the nuclear periphery and at the, uh, and periphery and at the centromere. And finally, because HP, the, these structures are formed by dynamic on and off uh, HP1 interactions, these structures are also able to be rapidly dissolved on the same time scale by other molecules such as HP1 alpha par paralogs that can compete with HP1, uh, with HP1 alpha. And so you can have both stability and rapid regulatability uh, be because of the intrinsic biophysical features of these phases. Okay? And so what I'd like to suggest is that what I've shown you so far is a, a starting point to conceptualize mechanisms of genome compartmentalization by other genome packaging proteins. I've shown you what happens with h and alpha and DNA, but I would predict that there are other molecules that organize DNA that share some of the same properties and might begin to explain how genome compartmentalization is enabled and what role phase separation might play in this process. Now, I want to just end by coming back to uh, uh, phase separation being of diverse types. You can have oil and water type of phase separation. You can have the type of phase separation I, I just described with HP and alpha molecules. Uh, what I would suggest um, uh, is that there are many, many more different types of phase separation in biology waiting to be discovered. So, so, uh, so what, what we need to do is to characterize these phases before we rush to define them. And with that, I'd like to thank you for participating in this virtual seminar. I want to first and foremost thank Madeline Keenan for spearheading this work and leading us into new and uncharted conceptual and technical territory. Um, I want to thank um, uh, Serena Saduli for the work she did in the context of chromatin that I did not have time to talk about. I want to give a big shout out to Cy Redding. Uh, he's been a wonderful collaborator and, and has really taught me a lot about the physics underlying phase separation. Um, and finally, uh, a shout out to Adam Larson who got us into the field of phase separation in the first place by discovering um, the, um, that each one molecules can phase separate. And uh, my, the, my remaining wonderful collaborations and uh, my funding, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. That was a very stimulating talk. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions. Oh, yes. So uh, didn't quite catch who came first, but I think it's Guan Chi. We'll start with you, then Margaret, and then Clifford. Hi, good. Uh... Thanks for the great talk. So I'm wondering, like, the, if I look at the, the, the force extension curve, it seems at uh, each pooling you have a different curve. Uh, do you know uh, what's the reason for that? Is, is it because that each uh, each pooling, uh, the, the size of the DNA cluster in the middle is different or some other reason? Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so le le let me uh, first clarify. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so what I showed you on the quantification is the same piece of DNA being pulled successively. Okay. And so what we see, and we don't fully understand why we see this, so we're still trying to figure it out. But when, after the first pull, when you pull the second time, the same exact condensate, it doesn't go as far. I see. And so something about applying mechanical force seems to also change the nature of the condensate, and it's, it's cumulative. And so um, 
I can speculate widely as to what might be happening, but we don't really understand it. It's kind of interesting and we need to do some more work. Thank you. Hey, uh, Margaret, you're next. Hi, thanks. That was really nice. I had a question about that last result when you have you flow in this HP1 beta, does it, the number two or beta version, does it bind to the DNA? It's a great question. Um, as far as we can detect, its affinity for the DNA seems to be at least two orders of magnitude weaker. Okay. But we think we can detect really low binding when you increase the length of the DNA. So it's possible it's competing in part by binding to the DNA uh, and in part by actually uh, forming heterodimers. But its affinity uh, for DNA is much, much weaker than uh, HP1 alphas. Okay, uh, Clifford. Hi, Gita. Nice talk. Um, I was going to ask the same question as the first one, and so it's interesting uh, that you uh, see this kind of hysteresis or, or you know, dependence as you go, which I guess suggests that it's not really in an equilibrium. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that's fascinating. And so, uh, you already gave an answer to that. So, I, I guess while I'm speaking, I'll just say I liked what you said about. Um, this, you know, there seems like there's been a rush to define different types of phase separation. And to me, it's all very, it's all hand waving, like no one's done any measurements. And so that's a, just an editorial comment, uh, uh, supporting your comment. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Cliff. Yes. I, I, I think it's, um, for the, since this is an NSF, uh, a bunch of biophysicists here, uh, as well, uh, the comparison that I, I, I'm drawing uh, is to the early days of the protein folding field when um, there were all kinds of models going about, okay, is it hydrophobic collapse? Is it this? Is it that? And there was a little bit of a rush to define this is how it is, right? And just to kind of uh, resonate with you, Cliff, um, I think biology keeps surprising us. So we should just wait and study it better. <laughs> That's, that's, again, my, my, my feeling. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Dave, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, first of all, it's a fantastic talk. Uh, there are lots of um, <clears throat> results that one could, in principle, quantify, as opposed to if you thought long and hard. I have a couple of questions. When you labeled um, the HP1 alpha and did the mixing experiment, it looked like after an hour and a half, the, the shapes of the droplets are more dumbbell-like, whereas when you did the DNA labeling, they were more spherical after nearly the same time. Do you know why this is so? Yeah, so I should, I should clarify <clears throat> that that was just the field of view that we chose. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's um, and what's coming, and this is, we are writing the story up, is a much more rigorous quantification where we look at the droplet sizes. So yes, that, that, that will, I wouldn't read too much into. Yeah. The, so it's all spherical. Pick, is, is it all eventually, spherical? They eventually become spherical. But what I did not have time to share was that, and, and this may be intuitive to some folks in this audience, if you make the DNA even longer, if you go to 8 KB or 50 KB, what I showed you was the fusion of droplets with 3 KB DNA. Then the shapes change. They don't, they're no longer spherical. That's because the, the, the viscosity of the DNA is fighting against the surface tension uh, behavior dictated by HP1. You start seeing these irregular shapes. And there, if you mix two types of droplets, they take even longer to mix their DNA. But HP1 still mixes. So, yes. which is why we think that the polymer properties of DNA really play a role. And so, as you make it longer, they no longer become spherical. So I think perhaps that's what you might have been uh, thinking about as well. Yes, the second question I have is you repeatedly said that the HP1 alpha exchanges on a second time scale. Um, but when you're in the droplet, and this may in fact go back to the pulling experiments at the end, um, how do you know that the HP1 alpha, which in fact are condensing the DNA, are not there permanently, and they, the ones that are exchanging are just floating around around that, and so that's fast time scale, and the other one is in fact trapped in this 
gel-like state may be? That's, an, that's a great question, Dave. Uh, and so uh, we are, I can tell you the first level answer and then I can tell you what you're doing to uh, solidify um, or test it further. Uh, the FRAP experiment I showed in the beginning, where we FRAP the whole droplet, we are quantifying those experiments carefully to see do, what percent recovery do we get? Because that will give yeah. us a sense of what fraction of HP1 is uh, bound that exchanges rapidly or not. And so far, again, th this is our initial, at least 95% recovers quickly, but we'll have to wait till we quantify it. And yes, I completely agree with uh, the direction you're taking the question. We need, to, we need a few more pieces of data. Thanks. Okay, um, Bill? You still have your question? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, uh, and really nice talk to you. I wonder, would it be interesting to look at the what's going on with the DNA in the droplets, maybe using FRET to look at how the DNA is compacted? Could you do that? Um, yeah, that, 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 is, that is a great idea, and that's something Madeline has toyed with. And potentially, uh, if we could label, so there's a few different ways you can imagine doing this, and I suspect you're imagining along similar lines. If you have a really long piece yeah. of DNA, you can put labels across and, and, and try to, um, or if you take two different pieces of DNA, short pieces of DNA, put different probes on them. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't yet done it. Uh, we, it would be a little bit like, and there might be others in this audience who are better qualified to talk about this, but you can actually get distance constraints. I don't know how to imagine this in the context of live, you know, uh, beyond saying that you f get fret versus don't get fret, could we get a, uh, a dynamic three-dimensional picture? But that, that would be great. I, I, yeah, I mean, the question is, yeah. with, are the DNA molecules flexing in there or yeah, are they yeah. sort of frozen? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, would be, that would be a great thing to figure out, especially the time scales of the flexing. Right. Yeah, because and I had a second question, and that is if the if these drop if these droplets are being driven by electrostatic interactions, can you can you phase separate DNA with spermine? And is it similar? Is it similar to HP one? Okay, okay. I did not include this slide. I have included the slide in other um, other talks, which are longer. So, uh, folks, uh, Steve Block and colleagues. And I think Steve Block, Michelle Wong, and others, they did a study, I'm going to get the year wrong, but let's just say several years ago, uh, where they looked at counter ion condensation of DNA, which would be something like spermine and spermidine. So you just take a polycation, mix it with DNA, and you can see uh, phases, right? And they did a pulling experiment. And, wow. and, 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 and there's a number, right? Can you guess how much force it takes to break that? <laughs> take a guess. 40 piconewtons. Oh, I don't know. Five piconewtons. Five, five piconewtons. Yeah. So that's spermine and spermidine. Again, it's, it's not a fair comparison, right? It's, the game is stacked against spermine and spermidine. They cannot cross-link. They don't have all the domains that HP1 has, right? But that yeah, gives us a benchmark, right? It gives us a benchmark for what a sim even simpler system would do and what the stability of that would be. Yeah, so that's quite stable. I mean, it's only three, it's only three charges on spermine, right, I think? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to get this wrong. Spermine and spermidine, there's a difference. Uh, but yeah, but, but, I think spermine is three and spermidine is two. Spermine is more, but I'm not sure which. Okay, there's a comment in here. Uh, three and four. Uh, one of them is three, the other one is four. Yeah. And I feel okay, like spermine two. has more. Yeah, so somebody's just talking about spermine. And I'm sorry, I can't, I can't multitask by looking at the chat. I'll just look at it. People, I see. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, but, but, but one it's, one it's, more it's question? an order of magnitude difference. That's Okay, we have another question from Jose Onacek. Okay, this was a very, very nice talk. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. I like your analogy to phase transition, although I think it's always a dangerous game to do those analogies and try to figure out which one is closer, but I, I like it. But I have two questions on that regard. The first one is when you go to the real chromosomes, they are much longer than the piece of DNA you're looking at. So you're not reaching equilibrium. And uh, so I don't know how much the analogy is gonna hold or if can you think about different domains doing separately even so they are connected. The second one is you addressed in the beginning of your talk 
you show the DNAs to the histones, and the histones are, tend to be positively charged. In the rest of your talk, you show the snake DNA. So what happens when you talk about heterochromatin, who have the histone, the positive charge, how you're now an allergy to polyelectrolytes survive? Um, great, both great questions, and we are working on both of them. So I don't have, you know, uh, sophisticated answers, but I can give you um, what we know so far. So for the first part, in terms of chromatin, you're absolutely, of course, right. Uh, chromosomes, and it's going to be even longer. And, and so we can uh, begin estimating, even by just increasing the DNA length, we're already seeing uh, shapes change, right? And viscosity effects take over. We're working on adding chromatin. So stay tuned. Uh, it's a harder set of experiments, but we're doing similar experiments with chromatin now. Um, so you're right that the chromatin is going to be kinetically trapped. It's not going to be at equilibrium, but I think that is the fun part here. Right? Yeah. I think that is what biology is taking advantage of, that the, the non-equilibrium nature of the chromatin folding allows molecules like HP1 to take advantage of the intrinsic viscosity to keep things trapped. But how about the electrostatics when you put the histones? Yeah, so let's come to that. That was your second part, second question. So let's come to the second question. So what I also didn't tell you because of time is that um, when you start looking at how HP1 molecules interact with chromatin, a lot of these other domains, the folded domains, come into play. Okay? Um, and um, we think uh, many of the folded domains, like the chroma shadow domain that forms a dimer, actually makes pretty extensive contacts with the histone octamer. And some of those contacts are going to change the nature of the electrostatics on the polymer. So it's almost like you're coating, you're coating the polymer. And if you think uh, simplistically, you start with DNA and hinge interactions and then add on interactions that now also deal with the histone octomer, then it's still on the electrostatic level. But you now start, you do start introducing hydrophobic effects. Um, because of another reason that I ha didn't have time to talk about the, uh, that work is published, what we found using the palm BHP1 proteins, and this is what, 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 when, why I, when, we, when Cliff and I were talking, I wanted to say, let's just wait till we learn more before we start defining it. Turns out the palm BHP1 protein uh, deforms the histone core. Okay? It opens up the core residues in the histone, in, in the histone octomer, and exposes hydrophobics. So now, imagine, right? Now, you don't just have electrostatic interactions driving it, but you've introduced new binding partners from hydrophobic residues that are normally buried. And now you're gonna have different types of multivalent interactions. So it's not gonna be simple electrostatics. And we see that because uh, the salt dependence does not match what you'd expect. It's kind of a complex mixture. So again, we are trying to figure this out by going deep into it, but all the questions you raised are you know, very relevant. Thank you, fascinating. Okay. okay, I think we should thank all the speakers from this morning. I, uh, it's been a great session. Um, we'll have a final discussion uh, in a few minutes. I do want to point out that there was some trouble with the YouTube feed uh, before the break. The talks were recorded, but they might be appearing um, somewhat later onto the YouTube feed. But otherwise, this has been a fantastic session. Thank you all again. Thank you very much.